social, which also includes not only the action, but also the feeling perspective. So how does a feeling perspective in a pro-social behavior looks like? It is very different from sympathy, but we call it something as empathy. Empathy is feeling the plight and the pain of the other person like being in their own shoe. So it's much more than showing pity and compassion to the other person, rather feeling the pain of or the plight of that other person who's going through that trouble. Also, pro-social behavior includes wide range of actions like helping, sharing, not only providing a monetary help, but supporting people, comforting people in need, and also cooperating. A simple cooperation and helping someone complete their work and task can also be pro-social behavior. Now, let's move to some types of pro-social behavior that we have. While, you know, the pro-social behavior is always presented as a single behavior in uniform dimension, which is you individually go up to somebody to support and help, but also it's always very uniform all the time. The way you support, the way you extend yourself also remains uniform. It does not change in its degree. So probably let's take an example. There are five people that you're supporting. You might help them uniformly together and uniformly in terms of the intensity, uniformly in terms of the strength of help that you're giving them. So there are some, some uh, distinguishing uh, pro-social behaviors that we have of types. One is proactive, one is reactive, and the other is altruistic. Altruism and uh, pro-social behavior is often taken as interchangeably, but it is not. Altruistic pro-social behavior is, uh, these actions include that, that you are meant to help others again without the expectation of that help coming back to you in any kind of personal gain. So we are looking forward and discouraging what in altruistic pro-social behavior? We are discouraging the cost and benefit that you talk about. You know, usually when we help and support people at the back of our mind, we always have this instance that this help might come back to us by this person in some form in or, or in some other form to us. So that isn't an altruistic pro-social behavior. Altruistic pro-social behavior would be that we will in, our actions would be intending and extending to help others without any benefit, without any need of you know getting that personal gain or that person benefit back to us. Then we have something which is proactive pro-social behavior. These actions that self you know serve us some sort of a self-benefit purposes. So it's like you are doing an activity. Because, you know, this is going to come back to me in some form or the other. So this is very different. From, this is complete opposite of altruism. Altruism talks about helping, extending yourself to other people and supporting them, comforting them without expecting that person coming back to you. And let's let's take an example. Um, helping somebody cross a road who's a blind. And I'm sure that blind, I'm not saying I'm sure, but you, eventually if you think with the passage of time, that person, might, you might not encounter even that person. So you completely, you know, discourage the factor of taking the benefit out of that old person. Whereas when we talk about a proactive pro-social pro behavior, it's going to be supporting somebody else in their, you know, in their project and expecting that once they finish their project and whenever you are in need, they come back to you. So that's something which is proactive. When we have another one, which is called a reactive pro-social behavior, these are those actions that are performed in response to an individual's need. So they usually perform so a kind of social work that you're doing because it's your need. That's something which is reactive. Reactive in sense, you it's a response to your own need that you give out to, which intends to help somebody. So the help is not genuinely coming because an XYZ needs it, is running out of uh, you know support and cooperation, but you want to gain something, which is your response to a stimuli is helping and supporting other people. It uh, generally could be social work for children, usually children at school and even colleges indulges in social work if they're applying for university outside or if they're applying anywhere. You know, uh, social work, uh, a minimum amount of social work adds on a lot of credits to their, to their profile and their resume. So that's something which is, I feel, a reactive pro-social behavior. You are doing something as a response, as a response to your own stimuli, which is response to your own individual needs. So this is a brief introduction again of pro-social behavior. Let's move ahead with some effects of um, you know, pro-social behavior. These are some effects, some theories that we have which impacts knowing that you know, pro-social behavior is something which is an add-on benefit to us. 
these theory are very similar to something which is interpersonal attraction and it also says that when could be possibly very similar the effect of similarity and similarity that we did last year I'll just run through it so that we don't forget what happened the last time it also suggests that two people who are similar to one another and two people like one another to find out uh, the you know a similarity in equilibrium amongst one one and other so also when we talked about interpersonal attraction similarity is also a way where we find in people that these are our kind of people and we support them and it's going to be something which is a need not only of us but also them because they're similar to us also fistinger also stated that according to this theory which is fistinger provided a theory that we tend to compare our attitudes and belief with other people only to judge the way of our attitudes and belief system so while we are comparing ourselves to the other we end up helping and supporting the xyz so there's a third party who needs support and help and while you're comparing your own beliefs and attitudes with other people your fisting who also stated the same in interpersonal attraction also stated that there are times that people while comparing their attitudes tend to support one another so this is like we both have similar attitudes and i should be the one who's going and supporting the other so it's like while comparison then there are adaptive responses we all know while we are adapting we all know that survival is a basic need of human life so while survival comes to play you want to adapt as like the proactive and re reactive pro social behavior as a reactive pro social behavior you do something because it's a need of you you are responding because it's an adaptive response for you so this is a very similar theory to a reactive pro social behavior that we support and help somebody because it's our need we need to fulfill a response to a stimuli so these are some general theories that support us let's come down to what is the motivation behind pro social behavior so let's just understand some theories that tells us what leads us to pro social behavior what are some triggers that allow an individual or a group of individual to do some pro social behaviors so first is the empathy altruism hypothesis this hypothesis suggests that you know this hypothesis states that feelings of empathy for another person produces an altruistic motivation to increase that person's welfare so you know when you have that feeling and you can understand the pain of uh, you know of another person who is requiring help who is in need of help that develops the feeling of altruism which is develops the feeling of doing something for the others and not expecting so providing help providing help to somebody who needs it and providing without expectation of it coming back is an altruistic pro social behavior so it starts with a feeling of empathy you understand someone's plight you could feel that need you know those that uh, that feeling that that affect drives you to feel that how bad it could be that person needs it and does not have it and that feeling develops altruism in you and you end up supporting the person so this is how empathy leads to altruism and then further leads to a pro social behavior so in this hypothesis the term empathy refers to the feeling of compassion also tenderness also altruism ref refers to the motivational state in which the goal is to increase another person's welfare at the end of itself you are not looking forward to your welfare these are simply stated as good deeds given without asking anything for exchange it's very similar to again altruistic pro social behavior the only thing that we have added here is you feeling empathetic about somebody drives you to develop a motivation which is altruistic further leading to pro social behavior such so chain you know that builds into us when when we see an activity happening when we see somebody who's in need now let's move to another model and theory or theory which is the negative state relief this theory and model suggest that it attempts to describe how once once our situational factors like sadness which relates to willingness to help somebody probably fear also at some point of time could relate to support somebody specifically this theory predicts that at, at at least under certain you know circumstances certain circumstances a temporary feeling of sadness is like to likely to result into an increased willingness to support somebody so this is trying to say a negative state of emotion which could be fear which could be um which could also be sadness which could be dislikeability of a day again leading to sadness any negative emotion can actually uh, increase your willingness to support somebody for example a person who's sad because a close friend just cancelled a you know a planned visit uh, would be more likely 
to help a stranger push his or her car out of a snow bank so why would a sad mood lead to an increased willingness to others you guys tell me why i will obviously answer it think about it see that as soon as you have that feeling of missing out on something and you see somebody who's in need we try to make that other person go because even we are missing that happiness at that point of time so what happens is that negative state of relief motivates you to understand a plight of a difficult situation of an individual seeking help and you end up providing help so this is how negative emotions make you very vulnerable at times did you not see that your negative emotions like i would not say negative emotions but emotions that makes makes us feel a little weaker like sadness fear um uh, uncertainty when you're not able to judge things and decide and uh, that's the time you start thinking oh i could have done this that way and that person is running out of that support i think i should help him too that's how you know that that sad mood drives you to support the other person and that's how your willingness drives you pushes you because missing in your heart in your mind in your cognition so help makes you increases that urge to support somebody else that's how an increased willingness to support the others comes into play let's move to another theory that we have which is empathetic joy hypothesis you see that picture on the screen for that so as soon as a person sees an emergency which is probably a person need on the road requires food or probably monetary help or there's just a bruised individual bleeding the situation leads us to desire to act and to make a positive effect on the victim so as so let's take an example there's a victim just fell down profusely bleeding on the street and you that's an alarming situation you see that person and this situation leads you to act how do you need to act that you you will act in a way empathetic joy the empathy now leads to joy i need to support him that joy will be added to you by the end of the support that you give so that empathy has added on to that positive effect on the victim and joy for you so for the person who provides support and help and engages in an activity that supports a successful outcome making the helper feel good about it so by the end of it you are full feeling joyful and there's a good impact on the victim so it's it's a very e equilibrated i think condition your support to your uh, victim makes him feel happy and makes you feel glad about it that you supported them so that's how a empathetic joy hypothesis goes on and how different is it from altruism altruism does not talk about leaving an impact on the third party like sorry leaving an impact on the second party which is the victim it just leads to helping somebody without you know expecting a benefit in return there is a joy talks about you receiving the joy and a positive impact on the victim too so it's very similar to two people your victim is also feeling good about you and you by the end is also feeling good about you so there is a kind of a benefit not something which is monetary and physically coming into play but in terms of emotion that is coming into play let's move to the next that we have and more theories to this is a competitive altruism hypothesis this uh, you know hypothesis as the term suggests competitive altruism suggests that it attempts to explain the presence of cooperative behaviors like helping and sharing in organism that don't have a direct benefit to the organism performing the behavior uh, so this is trying to say that you know at times uh, whenever does an attempt to explain a cooperative behavior or helping behavior in organism that don't directly uh, benefit the organism of that behavior we end up doing a competitive altruism like let's take an example this is again a very competitive state of mind two people looking at a situation now uh, there's a situation of sharing compete, comparing so how does altruism happens you tend to see from the other person is equally needing the similar kind of help and things that i am also doing you go ahead and help somebody so this is because of the competitive altruism i want to do better than the others i want to support that group i want to do a benefit to that so it's a very it's not a direct benefit that comes to you so again altruism does not talk about any benefit coming to you so that comparison that you're doing with your probably another group in competition drives you to do something you want to do it first i will support that group i don't expect i don't want anything in return here the return is not a direct benefit but in comparison you feel better than the other person so it's a competitive altruism and then we come to something which is a kin selection theory kin selection theory is very very similar to our natural selection which was given by charles darwin 
and it actually says that how our social behavior it's skin selection is foundation of our social behavior how we are interacting to people and uh, british uh, evolutionary biologist hamilton proposed that in 1963 that you know uh, your biological your relatives your biological genetic G dna everything actually plays a very important role in evolutionary altruism how we have the likelihood possibility of supporting those people more who are in our relative line or our kinship or probably more closer to our kins in comparison to someone who's farther away to our kinship so let's take an example of the first cousins or probably cousins who are uh, more related to your parent as the uh, birth order in the family so probably you do not have the first cousin rather support somebody who's more closer to your fathers or your mothers um, you know sibling order of birth so also another thing that they suggested that the evolutionary altruism cooperation social uh, sociality actually came up with this term called kin selection in 1964 which was given by Maynard Smith and suggested that relatives who are closer to, to our genes are helped more so you will end up helping people more who are more closer to your genes so someone who's you know farther away in relationship would not be considered to be supported for someone who's closer to it's very simple so we end up helping and supporting and being altruistic to people who are closer in terms of you know our gene pool rather than someone who's really far away that's that completes with maximum of our theories that suggest us that what is the motivation behind a pro social behavior it could be a kin selection it could be competitive altruism it could be empathetic joy it could be empathetic uh, altruism hypothesis it could be negative state driven hypothesis so see these are some theorists which postulated that what could be driving us to do a pro social behavior now this is some strength and weaknesses of kin selection see one of the um, you know strength of this is that it's empirically been uh, you know high which is scientifically a lot of researches have happened on our um, you know natural selection and the gene pool activities and who is closer to our in terms of our kin and it not only come as an example to humans but also animals also uh, hamilton which was the british british uh, theologist and biologist he also uh, you know gave a lot of mathematical stimulation on this theory which supports the theory directly again a high empirical data scientific data was there on this theory now there are a lot of limitations that we have it does not explain why people help related people more so what is the reason behind that you're helping a person who's more closer to your gene we have no reason behind it so the logic is missing the blood alone cannot uh, you know decide your kin relationship at times your community also does do that so you call your community also kins just not your gene and your blood does not address why cooperation continues when it offers little advantage also again i think why do you keep helping your kins time and again time and again when there is no advantage which is coming into play you know usually when we are in a family we tend to help one another thinking that this person will stand for me when i am in need so we now want to we did not address here in this kin, kin selection thing that why are we still cooperating knowing that this help is not going to come to us back so this was some drawbacks of this theory all in all this theory kin selection theory is widely and empirically um you know uh, has very high empirical data scientific data mathematical st uh, stimulation which makes quantitative numbers high so it has been well researched as a theory now this finishes with what motivates us to do a pro social behavior let's move to some a new aspect that we have which is called the bystander effect bystander effect is very closely related to pro social behavior how you know bry standard effect was a um, thing which was given by bib landin and john dalle this was a concept by social psychologists put forth the concept of bry standard effect following a very famous incident that happened in 1964 in new york new york it's it's based on a real incident that happened it was the name of the lady was kitty ginnews and kitty, this name has been theorized given in all the books so um, it was on the newspaper that's why there's a lack of we don't put it very privately the name is there it's based on a very real life incident i'll share the entire incident after i read the text uh, the 28 year uh, your um, women was stabbed to death just outside her apartment at the time it was reported there were dozen of you know spectators which you call as neighbors who failed to report 
uh, emergency and call the police at the right time. So now I'll tell you the exact thing why Bib Laljain and John Dali came with this impact and concept called bystander effect. And what is it this which is called bystander effect or bystander apathy? Uh, Kitty Kinnawoos was a working woman, a 28-year-old woman, working single woman in uh, New York in 1964. At uh, not very later hours of the night, but around 1964, 7 and 8 would be a later hours of the evening when she was returning home. While she had entered her vicinity, which has entered her apartment, there was somebody who, uh, mostly, the name of the, sorry, the person is mostly, mostly, the person also was uh, then further, the murderer was further caught accused and there was obviously trials over him and uh, he got the designated punishment which was required. Uh, so it was found that mostly actually was, you know, kind of uh, stalking Kitty Genovus for a long period of time. Long period of time was it? Uh, watching her going off and on from her workplace, but this night, at this odd night in 1964, he was walking by Kitty Ginebus and walking alone. And uh, he was covering her for a long time. And as soon as she gets into the vicinity, mostly who was the murderer, he stabbed Kitty Ginebus. And as soon as he started stabbing and Kitty Ginebus started shouting, the neighbors, which were a dozen, so approximately 12 to 14 neighbors came out at that balcony. First came one, two, three, and by the end of five minutes, there were approximately dozens and more neighbors who were watching this event where Kitty Ginu Goose was getting stabbed. Now, for approximately 20 to 30 minutes, there was no call of emergency which was made to the police or any, uh, you know, 911, nothing was made. And it was stated that, um, you know, the stabbing which was done to Kitty Ginu Goose was obviously life taking and she died on spot. And uh, by the time the police was reported and call of assistance was made, she was dead and mostly had ran away at that point of time. So what is this bystander effect? How does it happen? We had so many people who could have reported of that event at that point of time. Why did it take them 20 to 30 minutes for the first caller to make an effort and call for help, which is again called for a pro-social behavior. You don't know the lady, you know she's in help, you could make a uh, call and it might not come directly back to you. So this was pro-social behavior. What actually led people not to help? That was bystander effect or bystander standard apathy. is a social psychological term theory that says that individuals' likelihood of helping decreases when passive bystanders are present increases in number in an emergency situation. So the bystander effect says that as the number individuals' likelihood of helping will decrease as they see the number of bystanders standing next to them and not doing anything. So more the number of people increases, your bystander effect will increase because your likelihood to support and help people will equally decrease. So Lalton and Dale attributed bystander effect to two factors. They explain why does it really happen? First, see, we could say this could happen because of greatly because of a social influence. It's happening because of a large social influence. People are not doing it. Why do I do it? No one is coming forth. So probably this is not an emergency situation. Despite the women was getting stabbed, they did get influence that this was not important. Then we have something which is diffusion of responsibility. Diffusion of responsibility is how? Diffusion suggests that uh, we feel as a first by, as a first individual, the second individual will do it, make a call. The second feel of the third one has come in. The third one might do it. The third feels the fourth, the fourth feels fifth, the fifth feels sixth. By the time 12 people keep standing out there, none calls emergency and reports emergency or calls for help. That is called diffusion responsibilities. So as the number of people increases, the responsibilities gets diffused. These are two major big reasons which says that impacts your bystander, which um, negatively, which is it leads to bystander impact to happen, bystander apathy to take place. Now, another more reasons, why do people, um, you know, fail to help people, the other people, the uh, the people in need in emergency? See, at times, you know, we should we should also say it's very natural for people to go in shock and freeze when soon they see that there's an emergency. At some point of time, when a third party person, when you have five people watching, and third party person has been stabbed, bleeding profusely on the street, where there are so many people, you do feel under shock, and you feel okay, what to do? You feel numb. So this usually is a response because of fear, the fear that literally, you know, creeps into us and makes us feel weak. And at that point of time, our cognition stops working. 
we start misunderstanding the context and seeing a threat that this is so threatful i should not be calling this is dangerous i should not be intervening also at times you know what happened there's a huge accident which has taken place the police has reported but there are 50 bystanders none is calling the ambulance why the police is there it's going to be threatful i should not be reporting it this is not my thing i have never done it the first feeling that natural tendency of a human is staying in shock and feeling frozen and numb so that's like one of the first feeling that uh, you know is an obstacle to help and support people during emergency that we have so bystander effect like the image suggests see that person in the middle actually is calling out for help the other just moves away after watching him theorizes that in the face of emergency the distressed person is less likely to be offered help if there are multiple non lookers present which is more than one and two and there becomes many in number they're less likely to support the person who's in need let's move to another model which suggests that why does bystander effect could also be leading to so this stage helping model tells us what could lead to help and what curbs help what stops it so let's start with first thing let's take an example there's an emergency that is and you can even see the image the image is very beautiful it just tells us that how a helping behavior can happen at the same time that distraction along with the helping behavior could lead to no like that could lead to bystander effect that could take place so let's start with as soon as you uh, see an emergency what do you do you notice the event notice that something is happening so at this point of time when you're actually watching the emergency there could be um, you know there could be children like stop fooling around kids here we eat, here to eat so your self concerns comes into play and you get distracted with the emergency and there's an emergency there's an accident and your children are asking someone something to eat you distracted you have some important notification over the cell phone you get distracted so one way is that you notice it and you move to the second step the other is at the step one only you get distracted and you are unable to move ahead that means you do not move to the second step itself you get distracted you check your phone you support your children the emergency is forgotten now let's take an example let's go ahead with the model alongside you saw that accident you notice something is happening the second is uh, interpreting that someone is in need that is emergency to be perceived you perceived already that this is an emergency situation there's an accident there are more than one people who are bleeding in a need of an emergency what do you do you end up calling you you understand it's emergency the perception has taken place correctly but at the same time there can be some distraction here also ambiguity which is a sense of confusion uh, do i really need to call uh, is somebody else calling up pluralistic ignorance are others not helping them so is it something which is associated to a police case was the accident because of something big it's not a problem then so the potential cost of interpreting it incorrectly like two or more couple women or couple yelling and more help if, if both are women and if the couple is just arguing we just say oh they are mad at each other and this the fight ends up happening which is you know you start using your hands you feel confused oh it's a relationship it's a personal thing do i really need to go there do i really need to be one of those are they both attackers do they both need help that sense of ambiguity that you know it's a family thing or oh, it's something on the road the police is already there what do i need to do that's pluralistic ignorance that you do no one seems to be worried why do i need to they all are they all are fighting with one another the group of four why do i need to get in the middle no one is helping them pluralistic ignorance so at times emergency is perceived but we're not able to work through it let's go through the model you perceive the emergency now you decide to take the responsibility to support bystander effect is the key diffusion you know diffusion or responsibility plays a role many theories say is that you're able to you know make a call you call to the uh, ambulance and the help that's like you have taken responsibility at this point of time is also distraction which is you see so many people standing there why others are not coming someone else might be calling why do i make a call i think that person is holding a phone he is calling 911 So this is diffusion of responsibility. That's where the bystander effect starts happening now. You feel someone holding the phone during that accident. You feel, oh, they're calling nine one one. I need to do that. So that's where taking responsibility again gets distracted. Let's go through the model. You saw an emergency. You notice something is happening. You perceived it as emergent. Sorry, you perceived as it as emergency. The you know this huge accident. You make a call. Take responsibility. providing you decide that i need to help and you decide to help you start making a call to 911 this is also a time that you can get distracted which is knowing that i need to help now what i'm doing is it appropriate you start feeling incompetent 
911 is the only thing that I need to do. Should I even call the police? Oh, I think I should not call the police. So this is where you start feeling incompetent. I'm not trained to handle. I've never made a call to 911. What do I tell them? Do I need to tell them that there's an accident? Do I need to tell them that this is happening only an accident or should I tell them that it's uh, people are bleeding on the road? This is a lack of competence that you start feeling. You've never done it. I would not be able to do it even right now. So this is the lack of competence which do not let you go ahead. So you've recognized there is emergency. You've thought of interpreting it as emergent. You've thought of it, you know, taking responsibility, but while calling, it goes away. Now, let's go through the model and coming to the last stage. You notice situation, interpret it as emergency, you take the responsibility, take the call, make the call to 911, provide the help. You tell them what is happening, implement the help. Now what can go wrong? At this point of time, also things can go wrong. You've probably made a call to 911. Audience inhibition. I look like a fool doing it alone. What is the cost? What is the benefit coming here? I've called 911. If they come in, I will not stand here. I will not explain them the situation. What if something goes wrong to me? What if the police says it's because of me? So this is the last time that you get distracted after like you, you are just about to provide help and you stop yourself. You might have made a call to 911 and you stop talking, you just hang up the phone. This is how a helping stage model can also come into play. While, you know, five stage emergency model, if you, we recognize the emergency and go, we go to the uh, provide help. Five stage model and every stage can have distraction, right? From getting distracted simply by needs of your siblings, needs of your children, by your phone, then pluralistic ignorance, then bystander effect comes into play. Then you feel incompetent and then you feel, what's the benefit to me? Situational variables. What do I do if I give help? So this is another reason, so multiple reason at multiple stages that tells us how bystander effect can start in a situation of emergency. Now, more factors which, you know, depends uh, after bystander effect. Let's move to the pro-social pro behavior depends on many other factors. There'll be personal, there'll be situational, there'll be social norms also. So let's discuss after helping behavior can take place by the five stage model that we just did, which is a beautiful model that tells us this is how you can provide help. And also along with that five stages, there are five ways that you can reduce help and go to bystander effect, which is I might be sued. I might lack of in, lack of competence, bystander itself, division of responsibility, confusion, ambiguity, not feeling what to do. Completely confused, so many people, pluralistic ignorance, and the first is simple, self-concern and distraction. All these can also individually lead to bystander effect, which could reduce, inhibit the supporting helping behavior. Apart this, we have more factors that impact us pro-social behavior. There are situational, social norms and personal factors. So let's start with one of the few factors that tells us that what do pro-social behavior actually depend on? You know, at times, always remember, I feel pro-social behavior, very strongly I feel this, that pro-social behavior is an inborn tendency. Some people just have it. They, without thinking of their drawbacks, without thinking of their pitfalls, without thinking of what will I get in return, they end up doing pro-social behavior. So I feel that's like an inborn tendency. We are born with that tendency, that innate factor of supporting people. That just happens from a very younger age. So first, one could be genetic factors, which suggests that it is an inborn tendency. As soon as you see something in need, as soon as you see some people in need, what do you do? You end up supporting them. No distraction, no diffusion responsibility, no lack of competence that comes to your mind. You genuinely have that tendency to walk up to people and help. That's the genetic model. Then, which is a you know more like a biological approach that we have, then we move to something pro-social is also influenced with the kind of learning that you are provided. So, you know, it can also be coming from the family. How? Family, if has reinforced from a very young time, you know, when the family is keep telling, has always motivated children and telling them that pro-social behavior is something which is extremely important and you need to be doing pro-social behavior. And uh, pro-social behavior will add a lot of value and you provide reinforcement to children during pro-social behavior. Like, do this, support that individual or that child who's exactly of your age in need and I will provide you your, you know, your favorite thing. What are we doing as family? We are reinforcing pro-social behavior for, for our society. This is also a part of learning. 
Another form of learning is observational learning. You know, children have siblings or children are living in an environment or, you know, anyone is living in an environment who learns pro-social behavior through modeling. Modeling as in observational learning, you have role models, people who are popular, people who are acknowledged in the society ends up doing pro-social behavior and you end up imitating them, end up modeling their behavior, seeing that their performance is getting rewarded in the society, I should also do this, I will also be rewarded in the society. Now the third is the cultural factor. There are high cultural influences on pro-social behavior. Some culture actively provide this as a learning that you need to support the needy and the distressed. And individuals and cultures in cultures suffering from a shortage of resources may not show a very high pro-social behavior. This is something we need to, need to understand. Uh, so at times there are some cultures who actually tell their um, members that pro-social behavior is our motive, our motto. Helping people is our motto. So that's like greatly encouraging each member of your clan to do something which is going to support others. Support people in distress and support people in need. Now, always remember a culture which does not have maximum resources is running out of resources or there are scarcity of resources. Pro-social behavior is less likely to happen, which is very true. I'll give you a human example to us. You know, when we, um, people who are earning well tend to pay huge taxes, celebrity pay huge taxes, celebrity donate to a huge level, don't they? And why does it happen? Because they have a lot of resources. You know, a commoner here might be earning just few grants and few cases, and um, they might feel themselves that I might not be able to give as much. I can just give like a few hundreds here for of pro-social behavior. So probably somebody who needs 1000, I am incapable because I do not have the resource for me. So that is something that we need to know. If there is scarcity of resources in any clan, any community, any group, they will not, any culture, they will, they're bound not to help others. Next is more social factors. Pro-social behavior is expressed when situation activates certain social norms. So you need to know that pro-social behavior is expressed when you are act a certain norm in the, you know, a value in the group has been activated. That today when we are coming to the meeting, we need to help people. For one entire week, our agenda is to help people. That is creating a norm. Norms are very unstated rules. They automatically become a part of your organization. So as the norm of a social, you know, social responsibility is made, we should help anyone who is in need, help without considering any benefit. So that's like a norm. Once the norm is set, it happens. Then there is another norm, another norm which is the norm of reciprocity where people help others because the others have helped them in the past. So it's like you know very mutual benefits that we provide. The other is norm of equity. We should help others which is fair to them. If you feel that the person on the road is doing a lot of hard work but is not getting the right pay out of it, they're doing, they're doing their uh, you know, uh, they're not begging on the street, they are doing hard work, you know, hard uh, muscle body work and then uh, getting their uh, you know wages which is very less you provide them some support of education you provide them some support of clothing that is the norm of equity that we have so that suggests with norm of equity norm of reciprocity and firstly the norm itself now let's move to more other factors that we have pro-social behavior is also more likely to be shown by individuals who have a very high level of empathy these are personal factors now you know, this is something which is very personal to each other and very individually different. We are also going to talk about that. So with this, a person who has high level of empathy, an individual who is able to strike a chord with the person who has a plight, who's going through a plight and you just feel the need, oh, the person is going through so much. As soon as the empathy level increases in somebody, your capacity to feel the distress of the other person also increases. Example is Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa had a very high level of empathy and uh, I felt because of that she was able to provide to an entire community. That's why she's, you know, she was so known for her social work, her work of um, you know, supporting others. Because as soon as empathy increased with the passage of time, she was able to feel the distress of every individual in need and was able to do great things for everyone in the society. Then there's, this, there's another personal factor that we have after the social situational social norms is, you know, your personal mood. If you're in a good mood, you probably would feel, oh, I have so much, I can give some. If you're in a fear, you know, negative state of relief, you can still do and support other people. Also, if you're too busy, you don't even capture the emergency. 
you don't get to know what's happening you're so busy with your own problems you you are so much on your platter you will not be able to see the or understand the part of others this is a feeling that the person is help is responsibility not my problem i probably don't need to help so these are personal factors which could be mood which could be um, which could be situational factors mood it could be busyness it could be stress so the day you were very stressed physiologically and psychologically you might not help anyone you might feel i'm so stressed today i help them i will get more stressed and people who are relaxed in mind they might feel okay i feel that the other person is need i am having a good day i am feeling relaxed i could devote my energy here so these are personal factors so pro social behavior depends on many factors which could be personal situational social norms that we have let's move to a new unit that we have now which is after unit 6 of pro social behavior we have human aggression human aggression yes a very huge part of social psychology aggression you know is a word that we use every day to characterize people's behavior don't we do that if we are characterizing someone's personality we end up saying oh that person is so aggressive cannot control their temper we say that aggressive people uh, we call them aggressive because they yell on others they are being shrewd and loud on others hit other people they cut they show behaviors aggressive behaviors like you know puncturing people's car splitting off um, you know marks on the car skipping the traffic lights out of anger smashing uh, you know someone's door banging someone's door having giving a fist out of frustration to somebody this is all an act of aggression it's not only harmful to you uh, to the other but also harmful to you you know gautam buddha always stated aggression will burn you first before it burns the others so it is not only a harmful act for the other always remember it's going to be a harmful act for you itself it causes you anxiety it causes you frustration it causes you a boiling gets to a boil gets you to a boiling point which causes high bp which causes you know the entire parasympathetic nervous system hits you know it hits high which it goes up so harmful acts it could be injuries to other people it could be at times when it's extremely high and violent it could be killing people also there are some constructive violence which was be violence uh, which we see in the war which is soldiers soldiers do it in the war is not considered as aggression please when people of the forces people of indian forces or any forces are in play and they are at war and they are hitting people even the uh, you know our police services when they are aggressive when they are doing something out of a lot of vigor that's not aggression that is supporting somebody and there's a motive behind it so that is not it that is not considered aggression aggression let's understand what's a operational definition of it aggression as behavior is intended to harm other individuals who does not wish to be harmed so a person who really does not wish to be harmed and you are harming them is called aggression that's by baron and richardson in 1994 there are some theories of aggression let's go to them that will give us more understanding where is aggression coming from what is motivating us to get aggressive and how aggression is a part of our behavior so there are some theories behind it the first is called the drive and also biological approach to aggression this instinct theory of aggression was advanced by sigmund freud in 1927 sigmund freud did spoke about sexual drives being the eros you know something that directly impacts us so the great psychoanalysis of yester years he stated that uh, our behavior is directly indirectly impacted by eros the life instinct that we have and which is the most reproductive part of our life and in the background aggression was considered simply as a reaction of our libidinal uh, impulses which is sigmund freud always stated the same thing you started personality with me that you we we even done personality was we thought that uh, we always all our behavior according to sigmund freud is because of sexual drives so when these libidinal impulses libido is what sexual impulse your sexual potency is obstructed it's blocked when these are blocked remember what happens it leads to aggression so according to sigmund freud when these libidinal impulses are obstructed it leads to something which is frustration and aggression thus it was neither an automatic nor an inevitable part of our life freud also says that the death instinct is unrestrained and result of self destruction so he indicated that through our other mechanism like displacement the energy of thanatos which is aggression 
is redirected outwards. So as your you know sexual energy is blocked, you are unable to explore. What happens? You start displacing, putting your energy from one person to other. You start displacing, and this uh, this energy of Thanatos is called the darker energy. Eros is life. Thanatos is death. Is aggression, which is redirected outside to people and not to you. See, Eros, according to Sigmund Freud, was a life instinct, which is directed constructively towards you because you're able to reproduce and take care of your liberative energy. Thanatos is the death instinct because you're obstructing your uh, your liberal energy, your libidos are getting satisfied, your sexual desires are not getting satisfied. Because of that, the aggression thanatos is directed towards other people. So that serves as a basis of aggression and destructing self. Destruction self is showing aggression, shouting at people. You're entirely using your energy in your mouth and your vocal cords to yell at somebody. That is something which is called aggression, which is directed to self and others, which is thanatos. This was the instinct theory of aggression by Sigmund Freud. We have more theories, that is frustration, aggression, hypothesis, one of the most famous hypotheses. We always, I'm sure a lot of you might have heard people saying frustration leads to aggression. Yes, at a lot of time, frustration does lead to aggression. And it is, um, you know, it is a complete law to it. How? Dullard and Miller stated that, uh, you know, he stated that they, in their stimulation uh, theory, that yet no uh, illuminating book that they gave out which is called frustration and aggression defined that frustration is a condition where the goal is interfered is blocked that leads to frustration frustrating events are those which block an individual's goal-oriented behavior will not allow you to come to your destination and complete something your target that threatens your self-esteem that is self-esteem or deprive him of the opportunity to gratify his important motives and immediate goals. When an event and situation disturbs or upsets the child or an adult, it is obviously considered to be frustrating. So let's take an example. You want to go out someday. You're not able to go. You get frustrated. You start yelling at people inside of your house. I did not go out. I had a, had a plan today. It's got, so you get frustrated. But a situation in which, uh, which is considered frustrating for a person may not be frustrating for another. So there are individual differences, remember. And this frustration is then directed outwards and lead to actions which comes in the form of aggression. But there are individual differences. Always remember what is frustrating for you will not be frustrating for the others. And uh, parental training can also lead uh, calm down the frustration. So if frustration, aggression, hypothesis won't work, how would it not work? When we have good parenting skills, when we have good economic status, when early childhood training has been very peaceful and children are learned to tolerate frustration for a longer duration as role plays, as explain them through observational learning. All of this can reduce your frustration leading to aggression hypothesis. So this can also lead, lead to suppress aggression. Not suppress but control, management of aggression. Now there's another theory which is called the social learning theory. This was got out as an aggressive theory by Bandura, Berkowitz and others. The, you know, the main thought, the main central thesis of this theory was that an arousal which results from frustration does not necessarily lead to aggression. So they tried to refute the Dollard Miller's concept and they stated that apart the Dollard Miller's concept, we have other things which is apart frustration leading to aggression. There are other factors and conditions also that threaten us. Once they threaten us, they can lead to aggression. So according to Bandura in 1965, he actually demonstrated that aggression responses can also be learned through reinforcement just by imitation and rule modeling. And he did a very, very famous experiment of his times in around 1950s and 19, uh, you know, 1940s, 50s, which was called the Bobo Doll Experiment. You can check it out on the internet quickly. Bobo Doll Experiment. Bobo doll experiments, I don't know if you all have seen those Bobo dolls. You know, those are helium inflated dolls, with the shiny looking dolls, which are, you know, as tall as the child. You punch on them and they come back, you punch on them and they come back. So the children once was actually in the Bobo doll experiment. The entire experiment was executed when children were, uh, you know, bifurcated in groups. And it was found that uh, group A was shown that the participants in the Bobo doll experiment room they hit the bobo doll, they literally were sitting onto them trying to tear off the bobo dolls and they came out and they were reinforced. Reinforced how? They were given a pat on the back. This was group A. Then another group B went in with those bobo dolls to play. Did the same thing. A lot of aggression, throwing the bobo dolls, screeching, tearing, everything. 
when they came out they were punished they were scolded okay and uh, and the, another group b was watching that and group a has watched that uh, the group uh, the uh, half part of group group a was reinforced now group c half part is watching half part is playing the playing part does the same thing hit the bobo doll show their aggression but when they come out nothing was done they just quickly walked off so what do we see observational learning suggests a behavior that is observed is imitated when the performance is of the people reinforced and then put in our level which is a reinforced performance is now put in your own behavior you also start doing the same thing so out of group a b c which was watching group a was the highest aggressive people they watched that they will be reinforced so let's go in and hit the bobo doll and enjoy uh, you know hitting the bobo doll along with it so that was in a study on a nursery school children it was observed that when adults show various aggressive responses to a large doll similar behaviors were it was imitated by children which was found to reinforce it so that was social learning thought to it now we have some theories which are called drive theories and a gam model gam model is very it was a very um, uh, this is the model that we have it was a very famous model let's start with drive theory a simple their drive theory which was given uh, which was researched by berkowitz in 1989 and do and dolard miller mowers and sears in 1938 they argued that situational factors like frustration provocation by others priming cues like availability of weapons and uh, availability of information and thoughts and items around can also make you more aggressive and give you that it, that that thought uh, can lead to an outward aggression drive theories completely discarded and denied the innate theory they said that we are not born with aggressive tendency we we find situational factors that drive us to become aggressive so if your children are living with children who are aggressive provocative all the time that could lead to something which is aggressive behaviors now let's come to an important model which was a gam model which is gender aggressive model this was a very as we see a very comprehensive integrative framework uh, of understanding aggression this considered your social cognitive and personality development biological factors to contribute to aggression so the proximate processes of gam model suggest that how a person and situational factors the person factors that includes cognition which is your thinking reasoning your feelings and a state of arousal which in in turn can impact your appraisal of situation and decision making of behavioral outcomes each cycle of proximate processes serves as a learning time that affect the developmental accessibility of aggression knowledge structures so this distal model suggests us the upper part that you know Uh, the distal model of gam that how your biological and your environmental factors influence your personality that changes your knowledge about the structure so your personality interacting with your environment actually and the biological features gives us an understanding of how do you deal with aggression right now gam was applied to various situation of message to situation environment like media violence effect and uh, domestic violence intergroup violence was also explained through this temperature effects that leads to violence pain effects that lead to violence effects of global change and global warming today climatic change too much of heat in the environment most of the people are experiencing high blood pressure i feel in the environment why even little children reason high climatic changes disturbing climatic changes keeps our body warmer and leads to more body um, diseases because of this because we are not able our body um, there is no homeostasis in the environment no equilibrium so let me make you understand the proximate uh, model which is the lower part the input says that you see a situation your person and situation interact which is your personality interacts with the situation so how does that personality that personality is thinking there is reasoning there is affect and there is a state of arousal so as let's take an example um, there is somebody who is accusing you of something so as a person you are thinking why this person is accusing me why am i being blamed why doesn't the person see his own contribution thinking affect he always hated me your feelings arouse him i also hate this person situation he is loud he is very loud in accusing you in front of 10 people right now what your personality is very calm you usually do not overreact in front of people so now what will happen that input will root with the understanding of cognition affect and arousal and lead to either an immediate response you throw out there is no you tend to appraise that this person is always accusing other people and accusing me also you immediately 
you know appraise this person is not worth it resource sufficient like you feel that you know i am not happy with this person i need to just immediately throw out a name what happens as like the model that goes immediate appraisal happens you say a yes you move toward thoughtful action or impulsive action so you say sufficient resources not available i don't know about this person i just know that this person is accusing me he has a personality like this and i need to revert to him you equally start shouting at him why did this happen you did not have sufficient resources now let's take an example again now your distal process your biological environment and your personality factor makes you very calm you get to know this person is always like this does not have evidences but still speaking about me you have a lot of resources the outcome will be if it is reappraising going back that is the person actually talking about a genuine thing or not you get to know it's a genuine thing he is genuinely angry about something which has been unsuccessful you reappraise so from imagine you go to resources resources are there you understand i need to reappraise that this is a genuine case i need to give a thoughtful action you have a social proper encounter you explain the condition calmly to the person your personality is like that this still processes causing you to calm down and you do not throw out aggression this is how this complicated gam model works very very comprehensive integrative so your input will be rooted gives you an output by sufficing the resources you get to know if it is resources are insufficient you give an impulsive reaction resources are sufficient you think about the outcomes you reappraise yourself and you go to a thought or else at times you give a social encounter your social encounter can go back to something which is environmental uh, modifiers also but that again is individually different so that finishes with some model let's go to some causes of aggression we just quickly go through the causes of aggression and we we'll continue in the next class which is uh, instinctual we all know one of our major reasons is survival aggression is usually used as a you know as a defense to protect ourselves so it's like survival need instinct at times it's biochemical effect which is it is hormonal imbalances in individual that can contribute high level of testosterone could in both males and females can lead to aggression genetic it we are innate tendency children are at a greater risk of adapting aggressive tendency when they're biologically having a background of aggressive parental lifestyle father being aggressive child also show aggressive behavior physiological illness and temperament it could be serious illness illness can have a major effect on individuals mood so some illnesses can actually not times diabetes causes you very irritated makes you very irritated hypertension makes you very irritated leads to you know a mood uh, changing thing physiological illness that is then one of the most easiest thing that we can quote down is social learning imitating reinforcement and reward which are wrongly given to children bobo doll that i just told you was one of the biggest example that's why children who are playing video games a lot tend to um, you know tend to be more aggressive than children who play more outdoor games then the physiological psychological understanding that frustration leads to aggression once your goals are not met that can also lead to a negative impact a negative output which is called aggression this finishes with aggression and individual differences we all have individual differences in aggression and some gender also males tend to be more outwardly aggressive and females don't tend to be outwardly aggressive so individual differences are there our situations and our circumstances can make us aggressive both separately and differently and uh, hope this uh, session was good aggression is a very lovely lovely um, you know uh, concept you individually can see how different you are from one another we will continue from this the next time hope the session the teaching learning session has been productive for all of you and you understand that how i pro social behavior is so important to do and aggression is something that should not be learned in our society should not be encouraged in our society at all and with that individual differences allow both women and women and males to be separated that's why women tend to do not show violent behavior in physical activities and males tend to show for more violent behaviors and physical activity thank you